Good morning, I'm Rex Buchanan, former director of the Kansas Geological Survey. Today is November 2nd, 2023. Mike Lennon, former chair of the Kansas Corporation Commission and former Secretary of Revenue is here with me for this interview of retired West Star Energy Executive Jim Haynes for the Kansas Oral History Project. Our videographer is former Representative Dave Heineman. We're at the Dole Institute of Politics in Lawrence, Kansas. We thank the Dole Institute for allowing us to use the Elizabeth Dole Gallery and Reading Room for this interview. From the early 1980s until 2007, Jim Haynes was in executive management of Kansas Gas and Electric, Western Resources, and West Star Energy with a break of about six years when he was an executive at El Paso Electric Company in Texas. Prior to his career in Kansas, Jim was involved in utility regulation with the Missouri Public Service Commission in the mid to late 1970s. Jim was born and raised in Jackson, Michigan, where he began his post-secondary education at the Jackson Community College. He earned degrees from the University of Missouri Columbia in English literature and law. Jim taught at Washburn University as the Clark Distinguished Professor of Business and at the University of Texas at El Paso as the Scove Professor of Business Ethics. Jim's work in the nonprofit sectors included serving as director for the Land Institute and the Climate and Energy Project, along with many other community organizations in Kansas and Texas. This interview is part of the Kansas Oral History Project's series examining the development of public policy at the nexus of energy and the environment during the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In these interviews, we explore those policies through the eyes of experts executives, administrators, legislators, environmentalists, and others. The Kansas Oral History Project is a nonprofit corporation created to collect and preserve oral histories of Kansans who were involved in shaping and implementing public policy. Recordings and transcripts of those oral history interviews are accessible online at ksoralhistory.org and through the Kansas Historical Society and the State of Kansas Library. Kansas Oral History Project is supported by donations from generous individuals and grants from Evergy and ITC Great Plains. Thank you for being here, Mike, and thank you, Jim, for agreeing to share your insights today. Let's start off a little bit with just how you happen to wind up in the utility electricity business. It wasn't intentional. Um, I, uh, when I graduated from law school, I started out working uh, in the Attorney General's office in Kansas, and uh, after a year there, uh, there was an opening at the Missouri Public Service Commission to join the legal staff and uh, I knew I had worked with in the Attorney General's office the person who was general counsel for the Public Service Commission and he asked me if uh, I'd be interested in coming over to the PSC and working on his legal staff. And I decided uh, that might be a good move to make. And what year is this when you do this? Uh, 1976. Okay. And then when do you go from there into the private sector? January 1980. Okay. Uh, and I went to work uh, for Kansas Gas and Electric Company in Wichita, Kansas, uh, for the purpose of handling KGE's legal affairs at the Kansas Corporation Commission. How would you sort of characterize the state of the electrical industry, specifically maybe utilities in general, but the electrical industry at the time you come on board there and then in the, let's say the late 70s? It was an upheaval. Um, the industry during the decade of the 70s 
uh, went through tremendous turmoil. Um, prior to the 70s, I don't think Kansas Gas and Electric Company had ever, for example, had to go through a rate case uh, at the Kansas Corporation, a rate increase case. It periodically went through rate decrease cases, but never had to ask to increase its rates. Uh, that was a completely new phenomenon, phenomenon, not just in Kansas, but across the United States. Um, so, from a regulatory point of view, uh, it was a new landscape. And then externally, uh, you know, we had the Arab oil embargo of 1973, uh, the revolution in Iran in 1978, both of which again, changed the landscape for the electric utility industry. KG&E, for example, prior to 1973, uh, fueled all of its power plants with primarily natural gas and with a little bit of oil, a very little bit of oil. Those two events, the Arab oil embargo and the uh, uh, revolution in Iran changed the outlook for natural gas as a uh, fuel for power plants so dramatically that KG&E and other companies around the country as well, but KG&E was probably the primary example had to uh, shift its reliance on, its virtual total reliance on natural gas as a boiler fuel to alternatives. And the alternatives at that time were coal and uranium, nuclear. Uh, no company in Kansas had any experience at all with uh, a nuclear power plant. Uh, KG&E uh, was the lead partner in planning for Wolf Creek. Uh, we also participated in the planning and construction and operation ultimately of five large coal plants. Uh, in Kansas. Uh, we did that in partnership with KPL for three of them and Kansas City Power and Light Company for two of them. Also externally, this was a period of, of huge inflation in the United States. And that would ultimately figure into the development of many unforeseen uh, consequences that proved to be very problematic for being involved in such a huge construction pro process of, you know, being a 50% partner in a nuclear power plant and a 20 to 50% partner in five coal plants. Uh, on top of that, one of the things that, that happened in, in the 70s, another thing that created this, this turmoil that I talked about, was all of a sudden the uh, annual growth in sales and again, this, this affected not just Kansas Gas and Electric Company, but the electric power industry generally. The annual growth in sales of energy 
electric energy had pretty much revolved around seven to seven and a half percent for decades. So electricity usage was basically doubling every 10 years uh, throughout the United States. And all of a sudden during the 70s, that number drops to between two and three, four percent. The lead time for building a power, for planning, designing, building, bringing into operation a, a major baseload power plant, the lead time is five to seven or eight years. So you have to commit the capital, you have to commit to building the plant, you get it started, and, it, and, and all of this is based on the history of electricity usage doubling pretty much every 10 years, and all of a sudden it's doubling every 20 to 25 years. It's a big difference. And that leads to problems when you finish these plants and attempt through your regulators to get uh, rates increased to the extent necessary to, uh, to pay for these plants. Uh, and then you go, f uh, during this same period, you go from nuclear power being uh, heavily encouraged by the federal government, uh, applauded by local business communities, uh, to being uh, demonized as uh, the very worst thing that you can do uh, as an electric utility company. And, you know, we felt that in Kansas. When Wolf Creek was announced in the early 70s, it was met with uh, congratulations from all corners. And in five to six years, that turned around completely. And all of a sudden, uh, executives at uh, Kansas Gas and Electric Company, as I say, were, were demonized for having cursed the state of Kansas with the prospect of a nuclear power plant. So all of these things were percolating, boiling over. Uh, by the time 1980 came and I was uh, just starting out at Kansas Gas and Electric Company. Uh, and it was an exciting environment to come into. Uh, it was challenging. Uh, KG&E had a, a very contentious relationship with the Kansas Corporation Commission. That was as much KG&E's fault as it was the fault of the uh, commission itself. Uh, I mean, there, there should be some antagonism is not quite the right word, but there should, there should be some difficulty between a regulator and the regulated company. You don't want to have a situation in which uh, uh, regulators don't uh, challenge a utility company to do the best they can to keep rates low, to keep service safe and all of that. So I'm not, I'm not when I say there was a contentious uh, relationship between the Corporation Commission and KG&E, I'm not referring to those things. There were, there were 
personnel issues. Uh, it, it was not a healthy environment for the for the company, for the regulator, for the state. It was just not healthy. And I was pitched right into the middle of, of that. So all of these things were going on. Uh, and just sort of set the stage, the service area for KGME, I was associated with the Wichita area, but I assume it's, it's much broader than that. Is, that. is that right? Well, it is, but Wichita is the center. Okay. Uh, uh, pretty much geographically and certainly from the point of view of, of uh, customer density. density. Okay. And those five power coal-fired power plants that you, that you mentioned that are constructed during this period of, uh, probably planning begins late 60s, but, but construction is in the 70s. And those five are? Two at Lacine that uh, were Kansas City Power and Light Company was the lead company, uh, and three at Jeffrey Energy Center. Uh, in, initially, there were going to be four coal plants at Jeffrey Energy Center. The fourth one eventually was canceled, uh, but there were three. Uh, the first one at Lacine came on, came online, started commercial operation in 1973. The second one, I believe, came online in 1975. And uh, Jeffrey Energy Center, the first one, I think, was 76. Is that right, Mike? Maybe just a bit later than that. I think it was maybe 78 or 78, 79, OK, like 78, and then in 1980, the second unit came on, and the third unit came on in 83, I believe. Uh, another thing, uh, you know, going back to uh, my initial explanation of turmoil uh, that I was stepping into when I came to KG&E, the uh, first unit at Lacine, uh, Lacine 1, had a very, very difficult time starting up. Uh, it, should, it probably should not have been declared in commercial operation as soon as it was because, a, you know, a coal plant is expected to operate 60 to 70 percent of the time, and Lacine 1 never, never even got to 50 percent for several years and that it was that poor operation um, that sort of led to the contentious relationship between KG&E and the Corporation Commission because uh, the Corporation Commission attempted to keep Lacine 1 out of rate base because of its poor operation. Uh, KG&E appealed the KCC's decision and the Supreme Court upheld KG&E and reversed the commission's decision and that created problems between the commission and the legislature, between KG&E and the legislature, between KG&E and the commission and led, I think, to some of the commission's aggressiveness in the way it regulated Wolf Creek. So, and again, to back up, was the, the number one unit at Lacine, was that the one that was supposed to use Kansas coal? Is it that did, the reason and, that it was, was, and that was part of the problem. For so many problems. Okay. <laughs> that was a big part of the problem. Uh, the belief, I, I believe, I wasn't, I wasn't present at the time, but I, you know, from hearing talk around the company and whatnot, 
and, and KG&E was not the, the, the lead company on Lucene. KCPL was. Um, but I believe that some of the, of the um, romance around building Lucene One was that it was going to breathe life into a part of Kansas and Missouri that um, was economically uh, at a low point. And uh, we were going to use this Kansas coal, which from a, an engineering point of view was a disaster because it wasn't much better than dirt. And, and the plant had to be specially designed to burn this kind of, the, the boiler had to be specially designed to burn this kind of coal. And, and it, it just never worked. And eventually, we moved away from Kansas right. coal. And that's when the plant started to perform uh, up to expectation. But it took 10 years to get there. And when you say that it, they wanted it to be part of the rate base, in effect, they wanted KG&E wanted customers to pay for an underperforming electrical plant. Is that? I, that's not. That's not the way I'd put it. But <laughs> the commission may have put it that way. <laughs> but 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 bottom line, yes, that that's what it amounted to. You know, our view was that. Uh, we were prudent in the way we uh, planned the, the facility. Uh, we were doing everything we could to, everything we reasonably could do to make it operate well. Uh, and as a public utility under Kansas statutes, we believe that we were entitled to earn a return on our full investment in the plant. And the KCC took the view that uh, if the plant was not operating uh, up to expectations, customers shouldn't have to pay the full amount. And as I recall, the, the commission didn't attempt to exclude the entire investment, but excluded only part of it. I've, my, my memory is hazy about this. Do you? I, this preceded my time at the okay. commission, so I don't. So it, it, at any rate, uh, the commission issued, uh, issued a, a rate order that was way, way below what KG&E needed to cover the cost of its investment in Lacine, and KG&E appealed and prevailed in the appeal. The, the Kansas Supreme Court agreed with KG&E's interpretation of Kansas statutes. But that, that's really what the problem was, is that rates now were set on the basis of a highly technical reading of Kansas law, as opposed to being set on the basis of a power plant investment that was performing up to expectations. And revenge was sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I have one follow-up okay. question, sort of going back earlier. And so far as this move from natural gas to coal plants, really, by all of the utilities, I mean, was there an understanding then that natural gas simply would not be available at the fuel source? Well, it was more than an understanding. Yeah. Uh, in 1967, uh, KG&E's principal gas supplier was City Service Gas. And in 1967, City Service notified KG&E that when its current gas, contra gas contracts expired, they would not likely be renewed. Uh, utility companies would enter into long-term contracts for fuel. Uh, 
uh, for their power plants. You, you, you wouldn't want to build a power plant that, that had an expected life of 30 to maybe as long as 50 years if you didn't have a long-term contract for fuel because without fuel, the power plant is useless. So we had long-term gas contracts for all of our power plants at KG&E and it was, and, and they weren't for the entire expected life uh, of the power plants, but they were for 10 to 15 years. And there would be price escalators in there and that sort of thing. But in terms of the supply of gas, you were pretty much contractually safe uh, if you had a, a long-term contract. At any rate, city service notified KG&E in 1967 that its long-term contracts would probably not be renewed. And that's, that's when KG&E got busy and first entered into an agreement with KCPNL to build these, the two coal plants and soon after that uh, entered into a similar agreement with Kansas Power and Light to participate in the Jeffrey Energy Center. And then to uh, sort of put the, the final nail in the gas coffin, if you will, in 1978, uh, partly in reaction to the Arab oil embargo of 73, but primarily in reaction to uh, the revolution in Iran and the effect that that had on the availability of oil and gas. Uh, the U.S. Congress passed the Fuel Use Act, which outright banned the use of gas in new power plants and said that gas would be banned in existing power plants by, I think it was 1989. Now that became even more complicated when not five years after the Fuel Use Act was passed, it was repealed. And the planning cycle for a power plant is, as I was saying earlier, five to ten years. So, trouble all, all the way around. So, when you show up there in 1980, planning then for Wolf Creek is, an actual construction is, oh, yeah. Wolf is Creek well underway. Wolf Creek construction was well underway, yeah. Uh, so, how does that fit into your time there? Well, uh, that occupied Wolf Creek beginning almost the day I got there and increasingly so uh, for the next five years occupied more and more of my time uh, we had well I don't know I don't quite know how to say this you know we we had controversy uh, almost from day one with respect to Wolf Creek and and the Corporation Commission at one point uh, well, maybe this came along in 81 or 82, uh, ordered the company to uh, undergo a, uh, a review of the construction management of Wolf Creek, and they hired, uh, they, they hired, but KG&E was required to pay for uh, the cost of an outside audit of 
construction management at Wolf Creek. They hired a firm called Cressup, McCormick and Paget, one of the leading consulting firms for that sort of thing in the United States. And at the at the end of their audit, uh, Cressup, McCormick and Paget, to bring it down to one sentence, concluded that Wolf Creek was one of the uh, leading uh, nuclear construction projects in the United States. Um, but that didn't seem to make a difference with the public, with the commission. Um, and it certainly uh, didn't bring an end to any of our any of our difficulty, but to, to put it in day to day terms, we could see what was coming uh, at Wolf Creek in terms of how it was going to be regulated, what we would have to go through. Uh, in the rate case in order to get the, in our investment in Wolf Creek reflected in rates. Uh, and so we began preparing for the rate case as early as 81 or 82. And at the same time, we have to go through rate cases for the two Jeffrey units that are still to come online. Um, so it was a busy time. So is KG&E the lead in on Wolf Creek, and who are the partners? In well, that initially, it was <coughs> KCPL and KG&E at 50% each. And then uh, th there was a provision in the... Um, Atomic Energy Act that enabled uh, municipally owned utilities and rural electric utilities to participate in nuclear power plants that required them to be invited to participate in nuclear power plants. And it, the rationale for this was that, I believe the rationale was that that uh, nuclear power plants had gotten expensive enough and municipal utilities and rural electric utilities were small enough that they couldn't afford by themselves to build a nuclear power plant. So this provision in the uh, Atomic Energy Act um, required that they be allowed to participate as minority partners. So eventually, uh, I think, I can't remember the exact number of rural electric co-ops in Kansas that came together to form what was called KEPCO, Kansas Electric Power Cooperative. I want to say it was in the 20s, 27, 28, something like that. It was um, quite a few, maybe all, of the electric power co-ops in the middle and eastern part of Kansas. In the western part of Kansas, there's, there was another uh, generating electric co-op, Sunflower Electric Co-op. And the Sunflower uh, RECs didn't participate in KEPCO. But at any rate, KEPCO was formed by this large group of rural electric co-ops for the purpose of, of uh, owning uh, 
power generating facilities, but generally, but specifically forming KEPCO then gave them the, uh, the right to sue KG&E and KCPL uh, to let them come into Wolf Creek. Uh, and as I, as I recall, they didn't formally sue us in court. They intervened in our proceedings at the, uh, well, first the Atomic Energy Commission and then the Nuclear Commission. Regulatory Commission. Uh, they intervened in our licensing proceedings to ask the AEC to require us to let them come in as partners, which they eventually prevailed on. We knew they would. The, you know, the law made that clear. And they came in, I want to say, at 17 percent. I was going to say 16 or 17 percent. Yeah, on, yeah. Right maybe there. it was 16 percent, but it was... Yeah, 16, or, they, they would have been a substantial owner of Wolf Creek. Now, eventually, as the, as the demand for electricity in the 80s, well, starting, well, no, as the demand for electricity in the 70s and continuing into the 80s declined from those annual growth rates of seven to seven and a half percent. So that's one thing that's happening. Another thing that's happening is the cost of, of, of Wolf Creek continues to escalate because of inflation, because of new regulatory requirements. Uh, the, the anticipated need for Wolf Creek was declining, and that was affecting not just KCPL and KG&E, but it was affecting the electric co-ops as well. And the commission, the Kansas Corporation Commission, and KG&E and KCPNL went round and round about these annual cost increases at Wolf Creek. But, but then KEPCO comes into it and all of a sudden uh, gets involved with the legislature. And I don't remember how all of this fits together, but the bottom line is that KEPCO was allowed and KG&E and KCPL were basically forced to accept that KEPCO, KEPCO's ownership interest in Wolf Creek would go down from that 16 to 17% to 6%. Well, that did some good for KEPCO and its rural electric co-op customers but it worsened the situation for KG&E and KCPL because all of a sudden we have to shoulder more of the cost of Wolf Creek and justify bringing more of the capacity of Wolf Creek into our rate base when we get it finished. Uh, so that was a significant setback. Uh, I, and I want to go maybe let you follow up with this relationship with, between KCC and the, and the utilities, but before I do that, did it, was there a feeling in this time that you spoke earlier about in the early 70s and everybody looks at, at nuclear power as kind of the, the blessing. By the time you're almost done with Wolf Creek, it, it must feel like you know, we did what everybody wanted us to do, and now everybody hates us. 
I mean, there, there was so much yeah, concern yeah. about the cost and the environmental community pretty much mobilized. It must have felt a little bit like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Is, was there, it was felt that? worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was that like? I mean, that must have been terrible because publicly people are out protesting the construction of Wolf Creek in ways that Kansans typically don't go to the to the wall barricades on. Well, they they sure did for for Wolf Creek, uh, and um, I, you know, there were there were threats, personal threats. There were. Uh, Wilson Cadman, this, well, when, he, when, when it started out, he was, Wilson Cadman was the executive vice president of KG&E during the, the early planning for Wolf Creek. By the time I get there in 1980, he's president of KG&E. And within a year or two, he becomes the CEO. But he was the face of KG&E. Everybody knew that Wilson Cadman was the, from an, from, from an executive management point of view, Wilson Cadman was the, the driving force for Wolf Creek Power Plant. And he was attacked personally. His home was vandalized uh, a few times. Um, there was, I don't think there was ever anything actually done, but there was talk within the company as to whether or not uh, security services should be hired to um, keep track of what was going on in his neighborhood, and uh, it, it, it got pretty ugly. Uh, I mean, it got to the point where by the time Wolf Creek was going through the rate case and we were having local public hearings where, you know, there were standing room only crowds and public testimony went on for, well, until the early morning hours, um, and the threats had escalated. The general counsel count came to me one day and said that um, he wanted me to file a request with the Corporation Commission to require um, that people be searched before being allowed to come into the local hearings because KG&E executives were going to be there. And, you know, there was a, a concern for, for violence. We never, we never followed through with that, uh, I think. Saner heads prevailed, but there there was definitely uh, an increasing sense uh, of KG&E as a company and and its executives uh, being targeted by customers uh, for a variety of reasons. It wasn't. It wasn't, I, I have never thought that it was, that all of this was driven primarily by a fear of nuclear power. It was the tremendous increases in rates that I think drove the customer angst more than anything. You know, KG&E, up until 1973, had among the lowest uh, prices in the United States for electric power. You know, 
residential customers were paying, as I recall, paying less than two cents per kilowatt hour. You know, that, that was unheard of then. It's impossible to believe today. But, um, you know, with the rate increases from the coal plants, rates doubled. With the rate increases that we hoped to get for Wolf Creek, rates were going to quadruple. To go back to something you said, I, I, I think it's an, a, a real interesting observation. I, I think some of that, ob, that, uh, that opposition was based on concerns about safe operation and disposal of nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of one subset of the opposition. Mm -hmm. And the other subset is people that are opposed to higher rates. Mm -hmm. Just from a distance, it always looked to me like those were pretty different groups of, they were. of people. They may have had a little bit of overlap with some folks in the social service community they are concerned about increasing rates on, on people that can't afford to pay for it. But by and large, that concern about rates and how expensive electricity is, that was always sort of a technical issue that a lot of folks in the environmental community didn't know anything about and really, from what I could tell, were never all that interested in. They just didn't like the environmental side of it. I, 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 and and the, Mike, I'm sure, has a perspective on this as well. I, I would uh, just subtly m modify what you just said, and that is that the people who were uh, opposed because they were alarmed about the significant increases. Um, I agree with, with the fact that they were a separate group entirely for that. The environmental people, um, I kind of agree that they weren't as concerned about the rate increases, but they saw that as a way to exactly. fan the flame. Yeah. And they knew when they were talking to a crowd of people about their opposition to Wolf Creek, they knew with this group we should emphasize the price increases. Mm -hmm. With this group over here, we should emphasize the environmental concerns. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that, that sounds exactly right. <laughs> Mike, do you, when do you come into this picture? Uh, Not <clears throat> soon enough. <laughs> I joined the commission in 1983, and the order or the application was filed in 1985 for the rate case. I believe that's correct. Could have been right at the end of '84. The decision yeah, came out in '85. Right the, at the end the of '84. The very end of '84, or the very beginning of of '85. Of '85. Uh, right. I was wanting to just sort of go back a little bit in terms of uh, safety and concern, as well as cost implications. Something that happened in the midst of construction was Three Mile Island, which was some helped raise concern, I think, generally, uh, not specifically about Wolf Creek, but more generally about nuclear power. That, there was sort of that underlying angst. Plus, uh, in terms of cost, uh, that had, I think, significant implications insofar as having uh, you know, changed requirements uh, for construction. And, Jim would know way better than I what impacts that that had and how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission responded uh, to Three Mile Island. Well, you're, you're, you're correct, but incomplete. Um, there were th really three significant events federally that increased cost at Wolf Creek, and one event in particular at the state level that increased cost of Wolf Creek. The, the three federal events, uh, the first one was in 1972 or 1973. It involved the Calvert 
Cliffs nuclear plant that I believe was being built by Baltimore Gas and Electric. And the issue in the Calvert Cliffs case, uh, which went into the federal court system, was whether or not the siting of a nuclear power plant required environmental review prior to uh, that case, nuclear power plants did not have to go through any kind of environmental review in order to get their license to operate. Uh, that was challenged, uh, and the Federal Appeals Court, uh, well, it was challenged in Federal District Court the district court, um, well, I don't remember how the district court ruled, but however they ruled, it was appealed to the, to the uh, Federal Appeals Court, and the Federal Appeals Court ruled that the Environmental Protection Act required uh, environmental review of uh, nuclear plants. That meant they had to file uh, environmental impact statements, and the Atomic Energy Commission had to give a substantive review to those environmental impact statements. That, uh, the immediate effect of that was that the Atomic Energy Commission, as I recall, uh, I mean, this precedes me even graduating from law school, so I was not on the scene when this was unfolding, but I'm aware of its impact. But uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, I believe, basically called time out for a full year in order to prepare itself to receive these environmental impact statements and be ready to substantively <coughs> evaluate them. And in the course of doing that, the NRC promulgated uh, additional regulations for construction standards at nuclear power plants that uh, increased the cost of nuclear power plants, the time that it took to prepare an environmental impact statement and then go through regulatory review of it, including possible appeals from decisions, that added to the length of time it took to construct a nuclear power plant. So that's the first thing that happened federally. Then the next thing that happened was at um, a Tennessee Valley Authority nuclear power plant, the Browns Ferry plant, there was a fire. It was a devastating fire. And again, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission sort of declared a timeout as it reviewed construction standards for nuclear power plants. And the new construction standards that the, by this time I think we're into the NRC, uh, uh, these new standards added significantly more time to the construction of a nuclear power plant. And this, this lengthening of the time is going to figure into my last comment about what increased the cost of nuclear power plants, but this was at the state level. And, you know, Browns Ferry continued to cast its shadow over the construction of nuclear power plants for a decade. I mean, there were still regulations, new regulations being passed by the, the NRC in the 1980s 
coming out of a fire that occurred in a nuclear power plant in 75 or 76. Uh, so then the third uh, event that occurred that, that uh, caused the NRC to uh, change regulations substantially was the event that Mike brought up, that the incident at TMI. Uh, and again, more construction standard regulations. In this case, we had I don't know how many, I can't say exactly how many, but it could have been as much as 50 to 100 nuclear power plants under construction in the United States at the time that TMI happened. And many of those plants, when the when new regulations, when new construction standard regulations were, were passed by the NRC as a result of TMI, when those came out, many of those plants were, had, were at the tail end of construction. And in order to comply with the new regulations, they had to go in and tear out construction that was already completed, that had already been approved, and start over. Uh, so now the, the fourth thing that affected the price of nuclear power plants happened at the state level, and not, at, not in every state. And that had to do with a concept referred to as construction work in progress. How do you deal with, you've got this power plant that's under construction, you're investing, well, by this time, you're talking not about hundreds of millions, you're talking about billions, billions of dollars that you've gone into the capital markets and you've issued bonds, you've issued preferred and common stock, You've got to pay interest on the bonds. You've got to pay dividends on the preferred stock and the common stock. And many states, not many, a few states allowed utility companies to recover the financial cost, the interest and dividends of construction work in progress through their rates on a current basis. Some states, many states, probably most states, uh, like Kansas, said no, you don't get to recover a penny of this until the plant is finished and in commercial operation. Well, that significantly increased the cost of Wolf Creek and coupled with the regulatory changes that were coming out of the federal government because it lengthened the time of construction, because those changes lengthened the time, that added to the period of time that utilities had to finance out of their shareholders' pockets had to finance the, the carrying costs of what's invested in construction. All of those things work together to, you know, you, depending on what you take as the beginning estimate, and there's disagreement about that, the beginning estimate for Wolf Creek uh, some people put it at somewhere around 900 million. Other people put it at just over 1 billion. Not that much difference. If Wolf Creek eventually cost 
3.1 billion. So you could say it tripled the cost of it. By KG&E's calculation, and I, it's, just, it's just a math problem at this point, so I don't think there was much controversy about that, excluding the carrying cost of construction work in progress from rates accounted for almost half the cost of Wolf Creek. I have one quick question before we go back to the KCC relationship. Uh, and you were touching on that period of protests uh, about the power plant. How did you feel about the people who were expressing that opposition? I, I, I always sort of hate those how did you feel about questions, but you must have you clearly formed relationships with folks in those camps that, that continue on, or good relationships that continue on. How did you feel about them at the time? Did you feel like they were, were making good faith protests? Did you, what, what were your thoughts? With some of them, I had very wholesome feelings about them. And I looked at it as, you know, this is the this is the way things get done in the United States. You go to court, you hash it out, and you accept the result. And life goes on. Uh, and I, actually, I'd say for most of the people who we were dealing with, I had those feelings. And, you know, as a trained lawyer, um, you're, you're taught not to um, begrudge your opponent the opportunity to make a good case in court. And I appreciated the challenge of that. And from my own personal point of view, I never approached it with the idea that KG&E was entitled to anything. I approached it with the idea that we believed we had done the right thing in building Wolf Creek. We believed, I believed, that we had managed it effectively. And if I couldn't prove that, then shame on me, you know? and. But there were some people, organizations, that weren't honest brokers. And those um, I didn't like and still don't like. And why did, so to go back to this KCC relationship, why did you make the comment just now about Mike wasn't there early enough? I mean, what was that relationship like? And God, I hate to say this in front of him, but he was a breath of fresh air. <laughs> it's okay to say something nice. <laughs> I, I don't think we preclude that. Uh, how, 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 how so? Well, you, you know, I talked about some of the things that led to this contentiousness. You know, the litigation over Lacine One, which I... I, I said when I brought it up, and I will repeat it, that, that was as much KG&E's fault as it was the KCC's. But Mike didn't have that baggage, if you will. And actually, for that matter, if Mike had been chair of the KCC when that went on, I think it would have been handled differently, and we would have reached... Uh, an amicable result. Um, I think Mike approached his responsibility as a regulator similarly to the way that I described my approach to being an advocate for KG&E. Uh, I never had any doubt in my mind that Mike 
was trying to do, trying his best to do um, to do a good job as he understood it and in compliance with Kansas law. Uh, I had good relations with the former chair of the Kansas Commission. Uh, I certainly think that I improved KGNE's relationship with the commission, um, but it was a struggle working with the former chair. And were you chair during the the, the rate <laughs> hearings rate. for? Yes. Uh -huh. What was that like? Well, uh, Jim has talked about the public hearings that went on into the early morning hours. Uh, some were more contentious than others. I mean, we had multiple days, if I recall, in Wichita that may have gone until 1 or 2 in the morning at Century 2. Uh, uh, there were large crowds in places like Pittsburgh as well where, uh, you know, there was considerable animosity that, that you could sense and some expressed uh, toward, toward the company. And, and you mentioned Wilson Cadman. So th there was concern about how how, you know, what the environment might be there. In terms of the rate case itself, uh, I mean, we were learning, as everybody was through the hearing process, you know, about the construction uh, project, the procedures, you know, how it went. I mean, there were diverse opinions about it, of course, and, and sort of diverse recommendations as well. Uh, I mean, the hearings went on for what, months, really. Um, you know, ultimately, the commission came out with a decision that um, Jim probably did not think necessarily recommended the most uh, thoughtful or fair result that KG&E took it, and then did uh, absolutely what was necessary to begin to, to, to deal with the you know, with the outcome of, of the decision in terms of um, things like cost cutting, refinancing um, uh, debt, for example, and then ultimately came up with some really creative uh, ways of uh, addressing the company's financial needs without negatively impacting customers. I mean, it was a, I, I would say throughout it was a, from the KGE perspective, uh, viewing it, it was um, one of respect for the work that they did uh, throughout. Um, that adversarial relationship between people who are protesting Wolf Creek and KGE, did that spill over into the KCC too? Uh, that is, was it? A, were you ever was KCC focus of some of that as well as the power the uh, utility companies? I, I didn't really perceive that. I mean, okay. I, I mean, there always are criticisms about the, the process itself and okay. uh, concern that the, the commission is going to be, you know, uh, sort of the lapdog of the utility. I, I don't, but I didn't really uh, sense that that was a serious um, issue throughout that process. I mean, Jim may have had a different perspective on that, but. I, I, I never had the feeling that um, that, the, that, that there was excessive animosity toward the commission. It was, it was focused on. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think there was hope from every perspective that the commission would go the direction that a particular party was advancing. I mean, I think. You know, yeah. that, that was an emotion that, that you could discern throughout the process. Do you uh, look back on all of this and feel vindicated today? No. Because I didn't feel unvindicated then. I felt, I felt like I was where I was supposed to be throughout the process. And that uh, 
and that the process didn't work as well as it should have initially. The process meaning? The, the, the process of, of, of uh, regulation. Uh, the, the, the complete refusal of the legislature and of the commission to appreciate the fact that most of the cost increases at Wolf Creek were a product of government regulation, not a product of mismanagement. Uh, I'm not going to say that Wolf Creek's construction management was perfect in every respect because I know that it wasn't. But it was not imperfect to the extent that um, that warranted uh, the, the reaction to Wolf Creek, either from the regulators or from the customers. Um, I, I think that the, well, I, as I'm working through this, now I still, I still wouldn't say that today I feel vindicated because, because I never felt like that um, well, no, I guess I, 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 I guess that is the right word. I guess I do feel vindicated to some extent. I have my own reservations about nuclear power. Um, and, and have always had them. Um, not to the extent that I would not have uh, advocated for KG&E, or and not to the extent that that if I were, you know, the czar, I would have not permitted nuclear power plants to be built. But there were some pretty significant mistakes made by companies that were building nuclear power plants. Um, you know, the Diablo Canyon plants in California that were supposed to be mirror image plants. And I mean, that's a pretty basic understanding when you're designing something on a mirror image that you do you know, what's left over here is right over here, and, and they mess that up. Or what happened with the Midland power plant in Michigan that was basically built on, this is an exaggeration, but for purposes of the point, it was basically built on quicksand, and they eventually had to abandon it. Now, how do you, how do you make a mistake like that if you're doing well, and if you are regulated well. Somebody should have caught that. But here we are in 2023, and as you look at Wolf Creek, it's operated safely throughout that lifetime. Yes. It's, uh, it's, per its performance has far exceeded what even the company projected. We were criticized in the rate case for assuming that the plant would operate at a 70% capacity factor. <laughs> That's the worst that it's operated at ever. It, the, the power plant has gone for years on end never being below 90%. Now, if we had had any idea when we went through the rate case that the plant was going to perform that well, we wouldn't have had to ask for nearly as much as we did. I mean, that's one of the things that um, was a salvation 
is the, the literally world leading performance of Wolf Creek. Not for five years, not for 10 years, but now for 38 years. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's been unbelievable. It is pretty striking to look at that period in the 70s and early 80s that in a lot of respects, it sort of transforms the landscape of energy in Kansas as we build these big power plants like Jeffrey and mm -hmm. Wolf Creek that, that, like I said, change the landscape. In that time, since then, the big landscape change now is the profusion of renewable energy. Yeah. Uh, in some respects, almost as, and maybe, maybe in most respects, similarly transformative. Mm -hmm. uh, Certainly. And we're seeing the same thing repeat itself. People in Lawrence who were opposed to Wolf Creek for environmental reasons are now opposed to wind and solar in Douglas County. In terms of siding and issues related to yeah, that? Yeah, for yeah. environmental reasons. It does feel like an awful lot of what's going on, both in terms of recent events and, and those events we've spent all our time talking about, is Kansas sort of responding to the whims, and that may be the wrong word, but a very changing federal position in terms of energy and pricing. It's almost like the winds change all the time, and we have to figure out how to adapt yeah. to it. Yeah. Uh, so where is this all going? Well, one thing we can be sure of, people are not going to give up electricity. We're not going to go back to uh, the days when we read by candlelight. We're not going to go back to the days before everything has been reduced to uh, hey Siri, uh, <laughs> that's not going to happen. No, it's going to be the other way. I mean, that's if right. It, the, the reliance that's right. is elect electrification that's right. is the future. Electricity is the most efficient form of energy that has been created, and it increases our productivity by an unfathomable amount. There are so many things that we can do because of electricity. So we're going to have electricity. We just need to figure out how we can get it so that it doesn't hurt the environment, so that people are happy with it, with the way it's provided, and they see that it's worthwhile paying for it and that it continues to be safe. Mike, any other follow-up questions? I, I think that was really a good conclusion, I, actually. I, I, <laughs> but, but, but obviously, a challenge, the, the challenge is doing all those things because right. for exactly what you just pointed out in Douglas County, the same folks that are in favor of renewable energy may not exactly like where you put it. And the issue of transmission lines to move the stuff from where they think it ought to be generated to where it's used pose their own sets of challenges. Uh, it, it's a hugely complicated issue. It is. And it one is. that's difficult to, to uh, figure out how, how we're going to navigate. I do think, though, that the period of time that, that we've been talking about this morning, primarily the, the 70s, um, and into the 80s, I think that has maybe been the most, in my lifetime anyway, the most turbulent time in the electric power industry. Uh, and we haven't even talked about uh, the fact that when all this started in 19 in the mid-1960s, there were literally hundreds 
of investor-owned utility companies in the United States, and to now and today there are I don't know what less than fifty. Something like that. Uh, so that you know the, there have been mergers and acquisitions, and you know I got all tangled up in in that uh, when I went to uh, well when. KG&E and KPL merged to form Western Resources. Uh, you know, it's uh, there, was, there was one other thing that was going on in this in in that period of time that I was going to bring up that we haven't talked about, but it slips my mind now. But it was it was an it was. It was certainly uh, an exciting time to have a career uh, in the electric utility industry. Before we conclude here, let's talk a little bit about where KG&E goes and where you go as then the utility world. In the course of your uh, discussion, you talked about the three relatively large uh, investor-owned utilities in Kansas. You mentioned KG&E, KG &E, uh, KPL, and the Kansas City Power and Light Company. Uh, none of those entities exist as they did at that time. Uh, we now have Evergy that serves basically the same uh, service territories. And um, that seems to reflect sort of an evolution. You talked about the, the mergers and the reduced number of of utilities. Could you uh, discuss just a bit more sort of this evolution that occurred in Kansas and, and particularly with respect to the investor owns? Sure. Uh, well, first, each of those three utilities, KG&E, KPL, KCPL, were a product of 50, 60, 70 years worth of consolidations. In the beginning, uh, before high voltage transmission lines could move power uh, over long distances, utility companies were typically organized at a municipal level and each city had, each city of any consequence had its own electric power company. Uh, and Ironically, uh, in, in the very beginning, uh, power plants shut down uh, in the evening. Now, you, you think that's counterintuitive. Why wouldn't the power plants start up in the evening? Because people wanted light. But initially, power companies were primarily relied upon to, to provide power for businesses that were open during the day and closed at night. Um, but also, uh, there uh, were problems with uh, keeping up with, or there, there came to be problems with keeping up with the increasing demand for electricity, and eventually people figured out that, you know, it would be good to have lights in the house instead, instead of gas lights. The, the first house that I lived in when I lived in Lawrence was built in the uh, 19, 1910, 1911, and it had dual light fixtures, electric and gas from the same fixture. Now, the gas didn't operate anymore when, when we lived there, but it was a, certainly a curiosity. That lasted for a while. But at any rate, <clears throat> the power plants that were built to serve these municipal utilities were very small. And one of the huge benefits uh, that the electric utility industry discovered very early on was that the cost of building a 100 megawatt power plant was not double the cost of building a 50 
megawatt power plant. You could get a huge benefit of scale by increasing the size. And as municipalities grew, their power plants grew in size. But the economies of scale were still not fully utilized. And pretty soon, power plants were 200 megawatts, 300 megawatts, 600 megawatts. But in most cases, that was more than a municipality could afford to build. And they had no way to sell the excess power. And then we get the development of high voltage transmission systems where you could build a big power plant and serve multiple cities from it, multiple areas. And as that happened, it occurred to people, well, we don't need to have three separate power companies amongst these three cities anymore. And consolidation started. You know, uh, Kansas Gas and Electric Company, I, we did an exhibit for, I think it was part of the process of KG&E and KPL merging. We did an exhibit which showed that KG&E, and, &E, and I, my memory is hazy here, but I think it was that KG&E &E was the product of 74 smaller companies in southeast Kansas. So we get into the 70s, and as we've discussed, you've got KG&E and, &E and KPL participating in Jeffrey Energy Center. KG&E &E and KCPL participating in Wolf Creek, and the reason the companies are doing that is because of economies of scale. They want to capture the benefit of having of building a huge coal plant, a huge nuclear plant, but they can't use all of that electricity just for their own customers. But that caused people to begin to think about, well, maybe mergers and acquisitions in the electric utility industry need to keep going. And, you know, I remember talking with our system engineers at KG&E before any of these consolidations had come to pass, but I can remember discussions with our system engineers along the lines of, you know, if we, if we were starting over, we wouldn't have a separate power plant in, or a separate power company in Topeka, a separate power company in Wichita, and another one in Kansas City. We'd probably just have one. It made sense long before uh, it happened. There was Significant, notwithstanding that KG&E and KCPL were partners, and KG&E and KPL were partners, there was considerable contention. That's a word that I've used earlier in this. There was significant contention uh, among those three companies. Uh, there was always a feeling that KPL uh, got a better deal from the regulators than KG&E did, and I'm not going to step into you know, w w whether or not that was the case. I'm just saying that was a perception. There was always a feeling that, that the folks at KCPL considered themselves to be superior to everyone else. Uh, you know, Wilson Cadman, uh, said, as far as I'm concerned, they're the country club and we're the country. Uh, so you could, you could look at it on paper and say, you know, it makes sense for there just to be one company instead of three. 
but getting all these, these uh, personalities together uh, proved to be more difficult. And ultimately, what happened to bring all of this about was John Hayes, who comes into the CEO position at Kansas Power and Light Company from the telephone industry. He had spent his entire career at Southwestern Bell Telephone, and then he retired early, and KPL uh, needed a new CEO. John Hayes had served as Southwestern Bell's state executive in an earlier part of his career, so he was known in Topeka, and he was recruited to come to KPL, which he did. Well, KPL was a significantly smaller company than Southwestern Bell, and John Hayes was not satisfied to be just the CEO of another investor-owned company in Kansas. And he openly talked about how initially KG&E and KPL should get together, his terms. Um, Wilson Cadman didn't like the idea of that very much. Uh, Drew Jennings at KCPL um, he knew that he knew what John Hayes was trying to do, and I believe that he that Drew thought that he needed to do something quickly in order to get the edge on whatever KPL might be trying to cook up. And he launched an unsolicited tender offer for KG&E stock. This was unheard of in the utility industry. The only time it was ever attempted Normally, there would be conversations behind the scene. All of this would be worked out or it wouldn't be worked out. And if it wasn't worked out, the parties would just walk away and wait for another opportunity. If it was worked out, all the agreements would be executed and then it would become, be publicly announced. You'd get your regulatory approvals, and be done with it. But Drew stepped into the fire and just said, I'm going to pull the trigger, and he did. And that, <laughs> that was it for Wilson Cadman. The country club guys were not going to get his company, period. And he, you know, John Hayes had raised with him the possibility of KG&E and KPL getting together. John Hayes looked at all of this and he said, oh my word, I can't let this happen. You know, my chance of, of building a bigger company can't uh, go down the drain just because Drew Jennings takes an impetuous uh, act and follows through with it. So then, you know, for a while, it was KCPL trying to uh, appeal to KG&E shareholders through its tender offer and 
privately behind the scenes, and not that it should have been. I don't want to suggest that there was any anything unsavory about this. This is this is the way mergers and acquisitions evolve. But behind the scenes, privately, Cadman and Hayes were talking, and pretty soon there were teams of people from KG&E and teams of people from KPL who were meeting to plan out how a merger of those two companies could occur and thereby withstand, let KG&E withstand the tender, tender offer from KCPL. And eventually that is what happened. Uh, KG&E and KPL reached uh, an agreement in which KPL would, would uh, through a combination of cash and stock, would, would buy out KG&E's shareholders. And technically, it wasn't an ag acquisition, it was a merger. But, but in reality, it was an acquisition, and KG&E and KPL came together. Um, I stayed with the company, moved up to Topeka, and uh, eventually left and went to El Paso Electric. Uh, but. All the time that I was gone from Kansas, all the time that I was in Texas, I would, you know, every month, every two months, on a regular, semi-regular basis, I'd get a call from somebody in Kansas um, about, well, what would you think if this happened or that happened? And, and it always turned on the idea that somehow Western Resources, the company that came from the combination of KG&E and KPL, would acquire KCPL. And A few of those calls were coming from one of your successors, Brian Moline. And, you know, it, it was, I, I, I don't want to in any way suggest that Brian was doing something uh, inappropriate. More than anything, I think he was hearing rumors here in Kansas, and he wanted to have somebody who he could... Uh, use as a sounding board just to try and, and get a, uh, a sense of where the utility industry in Kansas might be going. But at any rate, um, then um, by this time, John Hayes has retired and not under the best of circumstances. And the person who succeeded him was a fellow who he recruited from Wall Street, David Wittig. And this was, you know, this, this was uh, right in David Wittig's wheelhouse. You know, he, 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 he handled mergers and acquisition business for uh, some of the best, most respected, most successful Wall Street investment firms. So, you know, the feeling was if anybody could put these companies together, he could do it. Um, but he didn't. Uh, he, he had a couple of misfires and to the extent that there had been any contentiousness between KCPL and KG&E and then KCPL and Western Resources, 
David Woody succeeded in raising that to an even higher level, to an unprecedented level, where they were slinging insults back and forth in the newspapers. Uh, David Wittig ran into some other troubles and ended up leaving the company. And I come along. And KCPL, not, not too long after I come back to Kansas, by this time it's West Star, uh, not too long after I come back, KCPL gets uh, a new CEO, Mike, oh gosh, what's his last name? <laughs> no, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember. Mike's last name, I, I'll, I'll think of it. But anyway, he comes back to Kansas. And I decided this is the time, this is the moment to get rid of this contentiousness between KG&E and, or West Star Energy, because it had carried over. Um, this contentiousness between West Star and KCPL. So within two weeks of Chesser, Mike Chesser, within two weeks of Mike Chesser, uh, starting at KCPL, I called him up and said, I'd like to come over and meet him. He was very amicable uh, to that. And I don't know, a week later, I was in his office. And we hit it off quite well, I believe. And over the course of the next couple of years, uh, we, I think, I think this was a mutual thing. I don't think it was entirely on, on my initiative. Uh, but we took every opportunity we could to be together at meetings, events, things like that, and we always uh, had something to talk about, some business to talk about, and I found Mike very easy to work with. I believe he found me to be easy to work with, and, and I remember one time he said, you know, you're, you're, you're a lot nicer than any of my guys said you were. <laughs> and I took that as a compliment. But anyway, it didn't, I don't know, maybe in the second year, maybe the beginning of the third year when we were, you know, getting to know each other, the question came up of, KCPL and West Star getting together. And we agreed that, that we should focus on discussing that. At the same time, uh, we were approached by Union Electric Company based in St. Louis. And Union Electric Company had very successfully acquired two or three electric utility companies in Illinois. It's based in St. Louis, Missouri, but its service area stretched into southern Illinois. So it was kind of a utility company like KCPL. It was right on the border and it had service area in, in both states, Missouri and Illinois. And, UE's case and Missouri and Kansas and KCPL's case. At, at any rate, um, so I talked with Gary, and I, I can't remember Gary's last name now, and I probably won't remember it because I didn't have as long a relationship with him as I did with Mike Chesser, but at any rate, 
Uh, Gary came to my office a few times. I came to his office a few times. And then when things really got serious, we met halfway in a setting <coughs> where employees couldn't see that we were meeting, where regulatory staff that might be in our offices or in his offices wouldn't see us meeting. And, and we got pretty far along with with uh, UE, but ultimately um, UE could not um, get to the price that we believed they had to pay in order to, and this was, uh, Gary made no bones about this at all, that given their past practice, this was gonna be an acquisition there would no longer be a headquarters in Topeka. There would no longer be, um, you know, there'd be a, a senior vice president in charge of Kansas operations or something like that. But, but all of the typical home office functions, accounting, finance, legal, uh, et cetera, would move to St. Louis. And, and typically, in an acquisition like that, a company is paid a premium. It's called a control premium. You know, you're, if you're going to give up control, you should be paid a little bit more. Don't ask me the substantive logic of that, but the marketplace respects it, and, and your shareholders expect it. So we couldn't make a deal with UE, so that, that went away. But during all of that, um, things were kind of quiet between Mike Chesser and me. Ultimately, um, Mike and I agreed that the time just wasn't right for Westar and KCPL to get together. So, I retire, Mike retires, and interestingly, the person who became the CEO at KG&E had been my general counsel when I was at uh, El Paso Electric Company. And I had introduced uh, him to Mike Chesser, who hired him to be his CFO. At any rate, um, then KCPL and Westar begin talking and they make a deal and it's turned down by the KCC. But they keep talking and they get to uh, a new deal, and that was approved by the Kansas Corporation Commission and the Missouri Public Service Commission and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the SEC. The approval process for something like this is, is horrendous, but ultimately it happened, uh, and I think there are aspects of the deal that, um, you know, as a far off observer, that I, I wish had been a little different. But from the point of view of, of the quality and safety and economics of ut electric utility service in in uh, eastern Kansas and western Missouri, I think everybody is better off. And as I told the commission when I uh, testified at one of the local hearings regarding the, the merger, one of the public hearings, um, they shouldn't let best 
be the enemy of good, and that that you know the, the deal wasn't perfect, but it was better than letting the companies uh, remain uh, as individual companies. Uh, now the interest, the really interesting question is, where does Evergy go from here? Is has Evergy reached sort of a natural landing point, and will there be another merger, say Evergy with UE, uh, or Evergy with Oklahoma Gas and Electric? You know, I don't, I'm too far away from it to speculate on that now. But I, th I think, at least for the, for the time being, uh, everyone involved is better off for those three companies to be combined. Well, with that, I think We've covered we a lot of territory. Is it time to smile? Uh, yeah, I think it's time to uh, look at Dave Heineman and, and, uh, and look pleasant. <laughs>